my colleague Charlotte, and we're going to talk today about Hug2, how we've dealt with it in March's Energy Agency, how we've kind of worked through any problems we've had. We mainly focus on customer journey support, so that'll be our focus today as well. Obviously, we'll talk a little bit about the scheme, about ourselves, about MEA and about the work we do. Yeah, my name's Jess Walton, as I said, I'm one of the project managers there and my colleague Charlotte will fully introduce ourselves later on. Yeah, so hi everyone and just to echo what Jess said, thank you very much for coming. So in relation to this slide, this just kind of runs through our agenda for today um, and the key points that we'll try and discuss in more detail. So firstly, we'll have a bit of an introduction to the March's Energy Agency, including who we are and what it is that we do really. We'll then have a discussion surrounding the Home Upgrade Grant Phase 2 in Shropshire specifically, where we'll outline the main aims of the scheme from our perspective, its progress to date and the role of MEA or the March's Energy Agency within its delivery. Uh, we'll then have a section detailing the lessons that we have learnt throughout the scheme and we'll conclude with a discussion surrounding our next steps in the Shropshire area and as has been mentioned there'll be time for questions at the end. Yeah so we've got quite a lot to get through but I think you know we'll we'll make a good start and I think it's really key to kind of talk about the lessons learned so I think we'll spend quite a bit of time on that as well. So yeah a little bit about us so my name's Jess Walton I've been working at MEA March's Energy Agency you're probably going to hear that abbreviation a lot and um, in one capacity or another for about two years. Years. So I followed that on from my politics undergrad degree, my master's degree in political ecology. So I started as a project manager and I was working on a Lab 3 scheme. So I don't know whether any of you have worked on government grants before, but that was the one prior to this, focusing on on-gas homes. And I did that in Black Country. I now work exclusively on the Shropshire Hug 2 programme and I have done for over a year and a half. Yeah, and my name's Charlotte Butter and I graduated from the University of Aberystwyth last year, where I studied human geography. I then went on to join the March's Energy Agency as an intern and then moved to be an assistant project manager where I've been working on the Home Upgrade Grant since April 2024 um, and also working on another project which I'll, I'll mention in a moment. So yeah, just a little bit about MEA, March's Energy Agency, as we said. So March's Energy Agency, it's an independent charity in Shropshire. It's about 25 years old. So I think it was founded a couple of weeks after my, my birthday. So it's about the same age as me. It delivers kind of practical solutions to deliver to reduce fuel poverty, called homes, promotes energy reduction and encourages the uptake of renewable energy grants such as Hug2, like we're speaking about. And um, so we're a very values driven organisation. If any of you have ever heard of us you you may have seen that as well and our vision really is to make homes warmer cheaper to run and make sure that everyone in Shropshire is living in a home that they can afford to heat and um, where carbon emissions and energy use is as low as it can be and in terms of our kind of four main areas me and Charlotte kind of discussed it and we thought these were the four most important points so fuel poverty so Shropshire is a very large rural county. There's pockets of fuel poverty everywhere. There are about 35,000 people living in fuel poverty in Shropshire and Telford, more in Derbyshire. And those are the three areas that we tend to cover for this kind of thing. So through our various grant schemes, helplines, other assistance we can offer, we've supported over 11,000 householders. So this can be all sorts of issues. So switching tariffs, introducing people to grants, giving them some low cost measures through home visits, such as heated blankets or low energy light bulbs and yeah it's really good to to kind of see that and go out into the county and visit these people and see them alleviated from the fuel poverty in any way we can. In terms of the people that we help about 44% of the people we've advised had health conditions. Now for those of you who know about energy efficiency and it's it's linked to cold weather and damp homes it can often exacerbate these health conditions so COPD, asthma, people in fuel poverty often experience these as well as a risk of being in a, in a damp home and um, so we're really keen to provide this kind of very wide service so we're just looking to support as many people as possible in the widest way so even if we can help over 11,000 people in fuel poverty if we can provide this wider support you know through speaking to their carers or looking into their specific needs because of their health conditions we really try and do that and kind of offer that large range of support really so another thing we do particularly with mine and charlotte's role in hug2 is working with partner organizations so we work with over 300 and this kind of includes installers for the grants councils retrofit assessors advisors 
sits in a vice bureau, adult and children's social services at local councils. And um, obviously these working relationships are really, really important for getting schemes off the ground, but also for kind of receiving referrals in. So having a good relationship with someone in adult and child services, sometimes they can raise some issues with us, someone who might need some low cost measures, might be eligible for a grant. And we can really help them in that way and kind of maintain the relationship to again, provide that you know wider view of support. So we try and provide as much help as possible with the grants. We've also found that quite a few people, obviously, if they're having you know new heating installed, that can be quite an invasive process. They may be struggling with cleaning their own home. They may need some help in the garden so that we can install maybe a new back door. So we can often you know build relationships with gardeners, cleaners, declutterers to kind of provide that extra support in order for the grant to go ahead. We've done quite a few in the last few months, which Charlotte will probably go into a bit later on. But it's really nice to see because as well as, you know, getting some new heaters or some new windows, you know, some people's homes can be decluttered. They can live, you know, much better in their homes. So that's really nice to see. One of the other aspects we wanted to mention is our home visits. So when we do find people... Um, struggling in fuel poverty, even if they're part of our Hug2 scheme or they're not. Energy advisors, um, we've got 12 or 13 of them now, the, the numbers kind of fluctuate. We spend a lot of time driving around Shropshire, attending home visits. So they go out and they take some low cost measures and they do energy health checks. They do heat audits, which is an in-house app that one of our senior energy advisors, project managers has developed himself, which has been really useful and kind of gives an energy audit of the whole house. They install low cost measures such as light bulbs or bring heated throws um, and it's a really great chance to again provide that wider support which is a key feature of MEA and a great chance to really meet vulnerable people and you know try and get their needs met as much as possible so yeah that's a bit about us and I think Charlotte's going to talk about our work in a bit more detail now. Yeah absolutely so um to begin with, really, we provide the customer journey support for applicants on the Home Upgrade Grant across the Black Country, Derbyshire, Telford and Rican, and of course Shropshire as well. And we'll outline exactly what customer journey support means to us a little bit later on in the presentation. We also have, we have lots of different projects across all of our different areas, and there's lots in Shropshire, but there were two here that we kind of wanted to mention. They're really, really relevant, you know, fantastic work's being done, really. So the first is Future Ready Homes, and this supports householders with privately funded domestic retrofit installs. So the project's really working to develop links with local trusted installers and creating a bit of a database where householders can access this information um, or that have been impartially recommended. It also, the project's really, really crucial in supporting householders with concerns they might have, concerns that are probably, you know, things that you come across quite a lot in your line of work, you know, surrounding affordability and disruption relating to retrofit. And the project also hosts webinars, events, and provides access to online resources as well, with the overall aim really of being able to install domestic retrofit measures, leading to decarbonisation in our local area and really having a community orientated approach as well. So really harnessing the knowledge base of local advocates. We also have the Community Climate Connectors Project, which I assist with when I'm not working on the Home Upgrade Grant in Shropshire. And this project was really born out of the quite sad reality that whilst the March Energy Agency has grown rapidly in the last few years, we can't keep up with the demand for energy related support in the areas that we're working across. So to address this, the CCC or Community Climate Connectors Project has the overarching aim of training members of the local community to become kind of climate champions who can help members of their local area to stay warm and well at home. So Myself and the project manager are currently training a lot of different community groups with a wide array of bespoke training, which really involves how to deliver home visits, how to give appropriate energy advice, and really looking at the role of an energy advisor in a slightly more simplified format, yeah, to really try and reach as many people as possible and to bolster that local community knowledge. So finally, in relation to our work, we also have telephone, email, and in-person advice services covering Shropshire, Telford and Rekin, and Derby and Derbyshire as well. And the these advice lines are covered by our energy advisors and Jess will go into a little bit further detail about what that involves and what we can do really in the next slide. Yep, no, that's great. I'm always happy to talk about um, the various acronyms as well on here. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to explain them well enough. So yeah, we have three main services that we provide across the areas. So we have KSW, which is Keep Shropshire Warm, which is for Shropshire. T, which is Telford Energy Advice, which is for Telford and Rekin. And WDD, which is Warmer Derby and Derbyshire, um, which obviously is 
is for Derby and Derbyshire. So yeah, as well as providing support and advice, we often do local events. You can see one of our energy advisors, Kevin here. I think this is Kevin. I can't really tell because it's so far away from me on the screen now. But yeah, we do local events, try and get people involved, linked to local community groups. Um, if the, we have quite a lot of green fairs going on in Shropshire as well, so we try and go to them as well and just link in with as many people as we can um, to kind of promote what we do. Um, we also use these services to get people into the local government grants. So yeah, it's all about providing you know, energy advice, tariff switching and very much what the energy advisors would do. Um, but it's also about providing that wider support for your home. So if they are eligible for a grant, we help them through the process of that as well. So yeah, it's, it's a really, you know, good way of providing that, you know, overarching support, which I keep going to mention the whole way through this, because that's what MEA is really about. And um, so yeah, a little bit about our energy advisors as well, because they're really the backbone of these services. And so like I said, they provide advice across all areas. So it can be heating debt, heating controls, billing, energy advice, the grant options, renewable energy options, they explore all of the options with the customer, point them in the right directions. We give them as much help as we can. We try and provide any external support. So if they need to be referred to, you know, social care or citizen advice bureau, they might need some help with cleaning or a befriending service. We offer that as well. Often they'll do home visits, as I mentioned before, undertake these kind of simple home energy assessments, installing some measures such as, you know, draft proofing, radiator foils, light bulbs, and then internally as well, for me specifically as a PM and for Charlotte, they do provide that kind of extra knowledge and support for the householder. So when they are moving through the HUG grant, it's not just a case of we're just trying to get you, you know, a new door or some new windows or some insulation. It's along the way we can help you with, you know, if you need to switch tariffs or you need a heated throw or anything like that. It's that, you know, ongoing support and advice um, that they help offer as well. So, yeah, I think we're really proud of our energy advisors and the support they offer as well. So, yeah, and now Charlotte's going to talk a bit more about Hug2 in general. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, really discussing the Home Upgrade Grant in Shropshire specifically. So the main aims from our perspective are to improve the energy efficiency of people's homes in order to allow vulnerable householders to be warm and well, alongside also considering the environmental benefits of uh, improving energy efficiency and embracing all electric heating systems. So in Shropshire, the measures that are available for properties include insulation, double glazing, energy efficient doors, high heat retention storage heaters and air source heat pumps as well well. We've had over 900 applicants apply for the scheme. Applications have now closed. They closed last month. So a huge interest in what what we're offering really. And in relation to the progress that is being made, nearly 200 properties are at install stage or beyond with works having been completed. But what's quite important is embroiled within this, I suppose, is whilst some householders do find the scheme really easy to navigate and they have properties that are very easy to retrofit, we do have quite a large number of complex cases, which we've flagged as requiring additional support from our team, really. And this is quite a common occurrence. As Jess mentioned before, Shropshire is a massive county where, you know, the average age of the population is quite high and properties are quite unique. And we have a really high number that are in conservation areas. We have a high number that have listed status. Another unique features, really, that are just quite quirky and things that kind of throw a spanner in the works, I suppose. Um, and because of this, often we do need to involve multiple stakeholders we need to have a reliance on external services and we do need to engage in regular proxy communication in order to meet the complex needs of a householder throughout their home upgrade grant journey and i think the best way to illustrate this really will be an example of a case that is still ongoing um, but which myself and particularly jess have been really heavily involved with so this particular person has 24-hour care and is disabled they were unable to return evidence for the home upgrade grant digitally so they received an evidence collection home visit and upon this visit, the energy advisor discovered that their heating system was broken. Um, so they were also provided with oil filled radiators as a temporary heating source. We then, after receiving this evidence, moved on to the land registry check on the property, which came back under a different name. So we provided support in helping the householder to prove her name change through providing us with birth and marriage certificates. The results of the retrofit assessment then came back and stated that insulation and an air source heat pump was recommended. Due to the householder's circumstances, she wasn't able to do the necessary tidying and cleaning that was required before an install could take place. So we arranged for a proxy member to assist with the cleaning and kept the proxy is the main point of contact due to the householder's vulnerabilities. 
When a further technical survey for loft insulation was carried out, it was reported that there was almost two tonnes of items stored in the loft uh, with no space internally to decant these possessions into. Um, so as a result of this, we arranged a holistic response with the local authority and a multitude of other external partners and stakeholders, whereby recently a dry storage container has been delivered to the property, a skip has been delivered to the property and a specialist external service have come in to help the householder decide what to keep and what to throw away out of the loft and the social work has been involved with this as well and all of this has been fully funded for the householder that is in a particularly vulnerable situation and whilst this is still ongoing I think it's a really important example of how we can help people to access the home upgrade grant and who may otherwise have struggled without our support and also how we've been able to keep them engaged when perhaps it probably would have been easier to turn around and drop out of the scheme considering the amount of disruption and work it's caused and then other examples where such in-depth support might be required, which which just has touched on are, you know, cases where people might require a decluttering service for hoarding, in-depth cleaning services and pest control. And we've also decanted householders in the past into Airbnbs or alternative accommodation when works have been too disruptive for them to stay at home. Yeah, so I think that's yeah, a really key point. I know the case that Charlotte is referring to, and it has been long ongoing and really complex, but it's really nice to see that, you know, the install's going ahead and it's going in and and the other services we've been able to provide have been really helpful to the householder anyway. So it's it's really quite rewarding to see that at the end as well. But yeah, the householder and the proxies have been really, really helpful and really on board with everything, which has also made it a lot easier. So yeah, we thought we'd also kind of talk through a bit about how our application process works, just so, you know, you can get an idea of how the different stages will kind of progress. I think Charlotte and I have kind of touched on the different stages anyway here. But I thought I'd just go through them in a little bit of detail so that you you kind of get an idea of what residents are going through when they apply. So the application is submitted in Shropshire. They do this externally through the council and then we're sent all the property details. From then, we get in touch with them. So this is our opportunity really to dive into those possible questions that might alert us to someone needing some extra help. So we often ask about, you know, the size of their property. We ask whether they have any disabilities, any health conditions we should be aware of, if they would like some extra support as well, if they'd like a call back from one of our energy advisors. Often, if, you know, someone just has a phone number and not an email address, we can sometimes surmise that they may need an evidence collection visit. They may need a bit of that extra support. So we wouldn't send out any forms electronically to them. And it's all these kind of little things that you pick up on that callback from the team that I think make it really valuable. And we get to know them a bit as well, which is really nice. And it means we can kind of when they come to go to install or any aftercare that's needed, we're kind of already aware of their needs and can point them in the right directions, which is really nice. And so after we've had this call, we do a proof eligibility check. So for the hug to specific route, there are three different routes to go down. So I don't know whether, you know, how much you know about hug, but I'll run through them anyway. So the first route is that someone in the household receives a means tested benefit. So this could be pensions credit, guarantee, universal credit, anything like that. Route two is that your annual household income is below £36,000. Route three, though, is slightly more flexible and we do see a lot of our applications come through this way. So it's qualification if you have a long-term health condition that can be exacerbated by the cold, such as asthma, COPD, like I mentioned before, if you receive a council tax rebate, if you receive free school meals. So this has really enabled us to get quite a lot of people through the door to make the grants more useful. So that's been really helpful as well. So they send us this evidence and we yeah, get it via email. We go and do an evidence collection visit either way and we check it. We make sure everything is OK. We do a land register check as well to check that they own the place, like Charlotte said. And then we refer them back to the council and they have a retrofit assessment. So obviously this is where they go around and they check everything over. They see what measures might be good. This then goes back to the council and the measures are agreed by them. We have very little to do in this process bit. So this is all kind of internal. We have other, um, the council have other contractors that go out and do the retrofit assessments. That's not something that we do. So we're kept informed by via the council on the measures agreed. Once you know that is agreed, we speak to the resident about it. We give them some more information, answer any questions. Again, this is a really good place to see whether they're going to need any decanting services, whether they're able to clear the clutter from maybe around their windows if they're having new windows, or you know clear out a bit of their garden so we can get the back door in. And if they're not that's where we'd employ the other services and try and get people involved to help with that decluttering, decanting, gardening. 
whatever is needed. And so that can be really useful as well. After they've agreed to their measures, so that could be anything from, you know, an air source heat pump to insulation to high heat retention storage heaters. Um, the installers then do a technical survey to make sure that everything is drawn up, all the plans are made available. The installers we have are really good at speaking to the residents about, you know, what they want. So sometimes in Shropshire particularly, there are certain rules around colours of windows and colours of doors due to conservation areas. So this is often a conversation that either we as the customer journey support or the installers themselves because they have the more technical knowledge and will be doing the installation will have with the customers so that's again a really good time to get their opinions and their feedback on the process and then obviously the installation takes place and the aftercare after that's done through that whole process MEA are here to advise provide any extra information they may ne might need liaise with contractors and at the end occasionally we get to do interviews with case studies for people which is really nice to see because we can see you know all through this sometimes quite long process we get to see um, an install at the end some happy customers and some you know warm and well householders which is what it's all about really and yeah I put my little home visit button at the top as well because all the way through we are constantly looking out for if people need home visits constantly offering this extra support so it can be quite a you know you can see from on the screen there are quite a lot of steps in the process and um, but we aim to keep people you know as up to date as possible as informed and especially if their application goes on through the winter provide that extra support for them. Yeah, so this slide now moving on slightly, we'll be discussing our engagement strategy for the Home Upgrade Grant, which is something that we've put quite a lot of time into. And I think that we're quite proud of and it has you know, been quite successful in Shropshire with us having had over 900 applicants, which I mentioned previously. So the first way in which we engage is through the power of the community really so community groups and local events so th through the community climate connectors project we have strong links with existing local groups that primarily have a climate related focus they're provided with a grant funding handbook and they also have training specifically on grants that are available and this has helped us to get the word out there and tap into local community knowledge surrounding people that perhaps are digitally isolated that won't see those facebook boosted posts you know that won't be able to access social media and things like that people that might be dubious and they might think that our letters are a scam you know people that we really wouldn't have been able to contact without the help of local people within the area and that trusted network which they trust we also build up relationships with local gp surgeries social prescribers social workers and other actors who may have significant contact with vulnerable people in the area so we do this through emails telephone calls through letters providing leaflets and flyers and just general information about our services really so that if they meet someone that they think might be eligible for the grant they can just signpost them straight to us then and in addition as Jess mentioned there's so many different events that are going on in the local community and we attend as many of these as we possibly can throughout the weekend at weekends as well to really establish ourselves as a presence and as an organization that wants to help local people so examples of the events that we attend vary hugely from the green fairs that Jess mentioned to libraries and they often do green weeks and to food banks as well from personal experience, I've found food banks to be the most successful way of engaging people in person, as in a very general sense. The people that attend food banks are often in a situation where they might be a little bit more vulnerable and they might be more open to grant funding, again, in a very, very general sense. But we have found these events to be quite successful. Another foundation of our engagement strategy surrounds local knowledge and data mapping. So the majority of our team do live in Shropshire or have lived in Shropshire in the past and as a result of that our knowledge of the local area is really strong which does help with us all having a bit of a general idea of where might be good to target and where to start really. Um, however we do have a data manager who provides regular reports on zones which might be ideal for targeting such as areas that are off gas, areas that have a low energy performance certificate or have an average household income average that's quite low and this data is crucial really in helping us to conduct marketing that is educated as a charity we don't have copious amounts of resources so you know making sure that our letter drops are accurate making sure that our door knocks are accurate and pop-up events are accurate again this reduces the risk of contacting people who aren't eligible and causing disappointment and wasting our time and resources as well and finally support from our energy advisors is a crucial part of our engagement strategy so many of our current applicants now they're on the scheme because they simply rang in to our keep shopshire warm advice line 
online and ask for some general support and energy advisors then being able to inform them about the grant and complete an application form with them on their behalf and in addition as as Jasper's mentioned home visits are fantastic um, and our energy advisor team are brilliant because you know they'll go out to our vulnerable householders and provide the support that we've previously mentioned and this is a brilliant way of establishing rapport between ourselves and the applicants and keeping them engaged in what can be quite a lengthy and disruptive scheme again the scam thing is something that comes up time and time again but having that in-person face to a name and having a contact within MEA has really helped to alleviate these concerns and to build up that trust with our local community really so I think moving on from that Jess will just talk about the lessons that we've learned now in a bit of a similar vein yeah, I was going to say, I think with lessons learned, it's a lot of these things came up, especially with engagement. It's something that can vary between grants just because of the parameters that are set. So, for example, I talked, I worked on the Lab 3 grant before. Obviously, that's on gas, which is very different targeting strategy. So we've had to adapt on that. So that's a, you know, lessons learned already. Um, I think in terms of lessons learned, I think it's a really great experience for the team to kind of get together. And when me and Charlotte were discussing these, it really kind of drills down into not what went wrong, because that's not what lessons learned is about at all it's about what was you know a little bit tricky or could be refined or you know might be an issue that we come up against in the future and it can be a very kind of positive way of looking at any future schemes and just what we can do better really so in that vein um, Charlotte and I came up with three different areas that we think were, you know, the most, have the most lessons to learn in, really. And um, so that's our complex cases, which we touched on before, properties more generally, including, you know, large homes, conservation areas, and advertising and targeting, which Charlotte's just touched on. So I'll just run through these as we go. So yeah, with complex cases, one of the things we have is multiple stakeholders. So Charlotte and I both mentioned this before. We often have to work with multiple people from installers to councils to other organisations managing these relationships and ensuring that there's always clear lines of communication is really really key um, we found this with the more complex cases um, like the ones Charlotte mentioned before and sometimes there's so many people involved you kind of wander into too many cooks spoiling the broth so if you know you don't have clarity and strong communication this can be a real issue luckily for us we have very you know on board and insightful teams. So, so from the council to the gardeners we engage to the you know people who dropped off the dry storage containers, they were really really helpful and really willing to get things done. So, it's it's been really nice to have that. But we did establish that all the way through. If we come across situations like this again, those that clarity and that strong line of communication is what made the you know the decanting the complex cases a success. And um, so that's key as well. Decanting generally, as I mentioned, if someone is particularly vulnerable, we sometimes have to decant them from their home. We had a particular case. I think an example is the best way to illustrate this, really. It can, you know, it can be quite disruptive for a family to have something like a high heat high heat retention storage heaters put into their home. Um, this family that we worked with had a disabled child and a dog, so this can often be difficult to decant. You can't just pop them in a Premier Inn. We had to look around, get Airbnb involved, try and find something like that. We ended up being able to find them a nice place, which was near the school, so the children could get there easily. Um, unfortunately, there was a little bit of a drop in communication, and we booked the accommodation for just over two weeks, as the install would take two weeks and we had to very quickly find accommodation for them when the install wasn't completed um, because of some other issues that had, come up, that had come up at that time. So again, this kind of illustrated those clear lines of communication and when we dealt with other ones similar to this, we made sure that we were constantly getting updates from contractors. So even you know after one, one or two cases, we're already in that process of improving the way we do decanting. It's very tricky and it involves a lot of conversations with the householder, but the household holders who have had it have been really grateful for the service and again it's just really nice to see that as well and those energy measures installed in a way that works for them and um, so on that vulnerable householders are mainly the reason we have these complex cases so it can often lead to further complexities when we're trying to install these measures so to help with this we as i said try and speak to people as much as possible we try and get home visits in we try and understand their needs the way they're living if there's anything further we can do to help so like charlotte said if someone's struggling to keep their house clean we will enlist services to try and make that happen for them, to try and make their lives as easy as possible, you know, with or without the grant. If we can provide that service, then, you know, that's what MEA is all about, really. And we've had some really good contractors, you know, gardeners and cleaners who've gone in and they've maintained those relationships with MEA and we can use them, you know, for other services as well. So it's a really key thing. 
One that Charlotte mentioned as well that I know she's very keen on is attitudes to renewal, renewable technology. So we find this mainly, Charlotte, I think, in relation to air source heat pumps. So there's a lot of misinformation around them at the moment, which I'm sure, you know, anyone who knows the technology will be aware of as well. Luckily, to kind of le- lessons learned from this one, we do have a wealth of experience in MEA. So that's something we kind of pride ourselves on, keeping up to date with the latest technologies. Um, we also have a really great relationship with the air source heat pump installers. So any questions or queries, we can go back to them. But it is something that does come up quite a lot. And we're hoping that, you know, through you know general awareness of air source heat pumps, this problem will also kind of eliminate itself as well, because they are really good technology. It's just alerting people to their benefits as well. So yeah, properties. Shropshire is a little bit unique. It is one of the largest counties in Britain, so that can be a little bit of an issue as well. We also have quite a lot of conservation areas. and um, We've got an area of outstanding natural beauty, which covers a lot of the south of the county. Um, there's a lot of you know, central Shrewsbury, very old Tudor buildings. Bridge North has a lot of Georgian buildings. And um, so we do find that there's many protected areas. Again, this is something we try and get hold of, this information in the initial calls with um, householders. We try and discuss the size of their properties. As you can see, large homes is another one of our issues. We try and discuss whether they know if they're in a conservation area, whether they have any specific planning rules from when they put a conservatory on or a extension or anything like that, just so we can build up that picture. And often, you know, keeping them alert of the fact that, you know, because they are in a conservation area, it may be tricky to install some of these measures. You know, they're probably not going to get approval for external wall insulation but we may be able to do some internal wall insulation. So it's all about kind of balancing those conversations and keeping expectations managed early on. Like I said, there's usually always something we can do, if not through one of our schemes, through our energy advisors. So we try not to you know, dwell too much on that with, with our conversations. And one of the things that I'm very interested in, which has been a bit of a learning curve for us, is MEES compliancy. So this is the, for those of you who don't know, the minimum energy efficiency standard. So this has to be abided by in law by landlords and means their property has to be at least E-rated. It also has to be E-rated to be able to be part of the HUG scheme. So if a landlord is falling south of this, um, we inform the council, they get involved, but they are more hands-on because they have the housing enforcement team, things like that. We're just there to explain this to the landlord, help as much as we can, try and bring them up to that E rating um, so we can you know, go down the the HUG2 route with them. Um, So that's been a bit of an eye-opener as well, but the council are really helpful with this and we use their compliance measures as well to get this sorted out. So finally, advice and targeting. Charlotte touched on this a little bit before, but what we try and do is with ineligible applicants particularly, we, you know, they could be ineligible because they earn too much, their property's unsuitable. Like I mentioned, it might be in conservation area or have building restrictions. There's any number of reasons they might not be able to continue with the scheme. Um, But we try and offer this support through, like I said, our advisors, our advice lines. And we also run other projects like BEST, Future Ready Homes as well, which we can also, you know, talk to them about and advise them how to get get involved with. There's also obviously, again, Charlotte mentioned the hard to reach residents. So people aren't always, you know, on Facebook, on Instagram, looking at things like that. It's a very large county with a very large rural population. So we try and advertise, you know, in local spaces such as newspapers or on bus stop signs or where you might not expect to find advertising for a Hug2 grant. So just not online and engaging people by visit rather than email is really helpful as well. And yeah, in terms of events and advertising, we have really learned certain areas, like Charlotte said, in food banks that really do, you know, people are willing to talk about hug there. They are willing to, you know, give their details and we have those further conversations with them. Um, So that's been really interesting with the Hug2 programme, learning where to advertise. And I think that's something we're going to take forward as our main thing into any any future ones, just that kind of targeting of areas where we target as well, because with off gas, it can be very hard to target people in those towns. So it does mean that that you're targeting those more isolated rural areas and how you reach those people to actually tell them about the grant has to be very different to if you were you know just advertising in a you know town center so that's been a really good point as well and using that you know data mapping best we can which our data manager Anna provides which is absolutely brilliant information so yeah I think Charlotte's going to talk about the next steps from this as well yeah absolutely so in relation to the home upgrade grant specifically whilst applications in Shropshire have now closed it 
in terms of the next steps, we're going to continue to provide really in-depth customer journey support for all of the householders who are at different stages of the scheme. You know, some people might not have had their retrofit assessment yet, whereas for other people, we might be trying to understand how their install has gone and trying to gain feedback from that. Um, So really diverse stages of the scheme, but providing support for everyone that is an applicant. We're also going to remain positive surrounding future grant funding opportunities and how we might be able to be involved with those as well. And then in relation to our advice and support, you know, really, we're going to continue to provide that impartial advice to keep people warm and well at home, really in order to contribute towards alleviating fuel poverty and our climate crisis. Big goals, but something that we want to be a part of. Um, And of course, this is going to be delivered in line with our charitable objectives. And then, of course, in relation to our newer projects, we're going to try and continue to develop those and get the word out, really. Indeed, throughout throughout October, we're hosting a Green Open Homes Day. And these are on a couple of different dates throughout October. Um, And basically what that is, is we are inviting members of the public to visit completed retrofitted homes across the Shropshire and Telford area. So it's a chance for them to speak to homeowners who have undergone the retrofit process, whether that's through privately funding it themselves or through grant funding and really gaining their opinions on the different measures that they've had installed to see how they work and to get a bit more information really. But yeah, ultimately, we really just hope to continue to develop our scope as a charity to get the word out and to help people that are in need. Yeah, that's the main thing, really. We're always kind of looking for new opportunities, but our main philosophy is to help as many people as possible. So as long as we're doing that, I think we're good. So yeah, that's everything from us. Thank you for listening. Our details are obviously on the screen if you have any further questions. We just want to thank Louise and Turner and Townsend as well, just for you know their help and support in putting this all together. 